Good morning. Uh, welcome to Chapel at Oxford University. Uh, whether you're here in Hoverston Chapel or on Zoom. This morning, we're having a word, hearing a word from the university president. We will hear a word from university president Paul Primenow who is joining us this morning in celebration of what I hear was his birthday yesterday. So if you see him, wish him happy birthday, and we're grateful he's joining us today. A couple things to make note of. Tomorrow, Wednesday evening, we gather on Zoom at 8 p.m. for word, music, and prayer. Tomorrow, we're going to be holding intentional space uh, for whatever the events of January 20th bring. Thursday in chapel, we'll hear from Pastor Justin, and Friday, we continue our eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence in honor of those who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racism. So please join us for those as you feel compelled. Now, it is good to gather in the name of the Holy One, no matter the means or method. And please join me in prayer. Creator God, maker of light, we gather this day, some weary from the darkness of night, some carrying the burdens of a world in chaos. Some hopeful as the light of morning dawn brings us a new day and renewed possibilities for a just world for all. No matter how we come before you, we seek your presence. Draw us closer to you. Help us to reflect your grace and mercy. Let your light illuminate the path to a new day that brings us closer to the world you desire for all your beloved. This we pray in the holy name of Jesus, the light of the world. A reading from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. And then this um, refrain from our theme ballad for this chapel series. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, Pastor Babette introduced us to the iconic Sam Cooke ballad that provides the theme for this semester's chapel services. And then she offered a powerful word about the call to watch for and be the change that's going to come. As I reflected on her challenge, I was struck by how the liturgical season of Epiphany, the time between Christmas and Ash Wednesday, offers us a rich reservoir of language and concepts to embrace this change that is coming. The 20th century theologian Paul Tillich once said that the opposite of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. I think of this point often during Epiphany when we celebrate the light that has come into the world and Christians everywhere are tempted to believe that all is well, certain even that the dark will no longer prevail. God has broken into our history, into our lives, and now the entire world will see that we have found the way, the truth, the life. And then I pause and consider the power of the darkness all around us, especially in these fraught times we witness the darkness of violence, of bias and injustice, of illness and death, of hunger and pain and indifference. Where is the light that overcomes this darkness? If all is well, then what are we to do with the evidence 
that contradicts our certainty. In her provocative book, Learning to Walk in the Darkness, theologian Barbara Brown Taylor addresses this tension of a world divided into light and dark. She writes, and I quote, I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light, things that save my life over and over again, so that there is only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. Her theological point, of course, is that we cannot afford to divide the world simply into light and dark or good and evil and believe naively that God is only in the light while all else is left to the shadows of our lives. Instead, we must embrace the reality that we live as those called into the light while residing in a world marked by darkness. How will we learn to walk in the darkness? Our two readings from the first chapter of John's Gospel illustrate this dynamic tension. On the one hand, we have these soaring words from the opening stanza, in the beginning was the word. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. And then just a few verses later, we are on the ground with Jesus in the early days of his ministry, calling his disciples to follow him. First it's Andrew and then Simon Peter. And then we join the story with Philip and Nathaniel, and it is Nathaniel who helps set the terms of our tension when he asks of Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Similarly, in Sam Cooke's ballad, we hear his proclamation that change is going to come, but it's interspersed with stanzas like this. Then I go to my brother, and I say, brother, help me, please but he winds up knocking me back down on my knees. You are the light of the world, but the world is marked by darkness. Change is going to come, but there is so much that needs to be changed. How shall we go forward? Come and see. I offer these epiphany notes from the field about what it means to receive and accept the invitation to come and see. Come and see the gift of surprise. I love the quintessential epiphany story of the wise men and its emblematic lessons for what it means to fall in love with God again, to be drawn by something as compelling as a sacred star out of our positions of power and privilege on journeys of risk and adventure, finally to reach our destination and to find this remarkable surprise this counterintuitive God, this child in his mother's arms, and then to offer our rare gifts, to worship, to return home by another route, to be changed forever. I think about the logic of this love story, especially this week when we consider Martin Luther King Jr., whose life and work we honored just yesterday, and the journey that he undertook, and the surprises he encountered along the way, often unwelcome surprises and how his vocation unfolded on unexpected and life-changing ways. Instead of the scholar's life or the prestigious pulpit, Dr. King was drawn by a dream to make a journey to encounter the surprises of a life of discipleship and to give everything, everything to follow the call. Come and see. Come and see the call to be neighbor in these pandemic times, it has sometimes been hard to know how to be neighbors when we are forced to stay away from each other. But I've been inspired by so many of our staff and faculty and students who have redoubled their efforts to walk alongside our neighbors and to follow the path of discipleship to a God who calls us to feed the hungry, free the oppressed, heal the sick, and fight for justice, the way, the truth, the life. If you haven't noticed, check out the Shop Local campaign spearheaded by our Sable Center for Democracy and Citizenship that is supporting local businesses. Or look again and maybe volunteer at the Campus Kitchen, which is meeting the needs of our neighbors who are food insecure on and off campus. See how the Minnesota Urban Debate League has moved its programs online so that middle and high school students across the metro area can continue to participate in debate programs that equip them for success in college and beyond. 
witness the work of our health commons in downtown Minneapolis and here in Cedar Riverside, offering food and water and comfort and kindness to those so in need. Our students and coworkers and fellow faithful may most fully discern their cause as they are inspired and nurtured to make a difference in the lives of our neighbors, to be of service in the world, to be God's hands and the face of Christ to our fellow travelers. Surely Peter and Philip and Nathaniel didn't know exactly what was going on when Jesus called and named them, but they followed and served. You shall be my disciples, Jesus said, and through you shall my people find their way in the world. Come and see. Come and see the promise of abundance. I would venture that the most significant challenge we all face in being faithful and following our calls is the fact that we live in a world marked by a perspective of scarcity. And to my mind, the scarcity we experience is too often a result of wanting answers here and now, of fearing the dark, the unknown and surprising, of not being able to deal with the messiness of the called life. Consider again our gospel for this morning. If we want firm answers, this is not the place to look. But if we are looking and willing to accept the invitation to abundance, the invitation to be loved and claimed, the invitation to follow our Lord, then here is our call. I learned a great deal about abundance from my friend and faculty colleague, J. Wall Jasper, who tragically passed away just before Christmas. Jay was a Renaissance person, a journalist, an activist, a believer in what we all share in common. In our teaching together over the past decade, we explored with our students the wonders of cities, places that mattered. Time and again, Jay would share his passion for the ordinary ways in which cities are places of abundance. Jay liked to quote the Mexican novelist Carlos Fuentes, who says, and I quote, the citizen takes the city for granted far too often. He and she forget to marvel. Jay Walsh-Dasper never forgot to marvel. And in his marveling, he taught all of us to believe in the promise of abundance. Rest in abundant power, Jay. Change is gonna come. Indeed, it is happening in our midst. Come and see. Come and see. Thanks be to God. Amen. have sought a light in the heart of the darkest night just when we thought all would be lost we were drawn to the light of God gone is in sight gone is the night drawn to the light and the morning glorious and bright oh what a sight to be drawn to the light of god how can we tell a heaven from hell if everyone dwells in the dark of night morning dispels gently compels and we're drawn to the light of god dawn is in sight dawn is the night drawn to the light and the morning glorious and bright oh what a sight 
we draw to the light of God. Where is the sun? Oh, there will be none. The Lamb is the one who is shining bright, bids us to come. Life has begun when we're drawn to the light of God. Dawn is in sight, gone is the night, drawn to the light and the morning. Glorious and bright, oh, what a sight to be drawn to the light of God. Yes, it's working now. <laughs> Receive this benediction. May the light of Christ burn brightly within you, that the world may see the loving source of all light, Jesus the Christ. Now go forth from this space, reflecting the light of God that will draw us closer to God and one another. Amen.